Day 67 I took my more recently favored, more circuitous path home from work. The sidewalk along this street was formed from sooty black bricks, like the crowded buildings that faced it. Grey translucent grass and weeds grew at a confluence of the sidewalk and wall. I had managed to elude Larry's attempts at walking home with me. I stopped briefly in a small bookshop along the way, as I had done before. There was a printing press in the back room. I'd seen the door left half open, had heard its churning sounds. The offering was small, chapbooks, stapled at the spine, nothing perfect bound. Memoirs, brief autobiographies, poetry or short story collections, novellas at most. No religious propaganda or anything like that, and it was not any kind of diabolic establishment. It was managed and operated by a small group of citizens, publishing and distributing the writing of other citizens. Naturally, I found most of the work I'd already bought to be amateurish and sophomoric. The typos, few, I credited the publishers for this more so than the authors. But the actual prose seldom above the level of a high school creative writing class. The fiction cliched, often maudlin, the non-fiction of little interest to anyone who had not lived it themselves. And yet I was grateful for even the worst of it, and was only too happy to spend my hard-won coins on it. Even though I wished Anne Sexton, writers who interested me greatly, having both ended their lives as I had, were citizens of oblivion. Today I bought a slim collection of poems by yet another obscure author. Not for the first time, I wondered if this publishing house, Necropolitan Press, might be inclined to publish this journal of mine. I had been entertaining the fantasy of slipping it through some cracks in the wall of hell, sneaking it into the living world through a portal. Might some of the more infernal of the world's books have found their way into the hands of Satanists in that manner? Might these Satanists heed my warnings, mend their ways so as to avoid my fate? But it seems unlikely that it's possible. It's said that a spirit cannot be translated back into matter. If it were so, I might as well try slipping through some chink myself. I've heard only demons and celestials can accomplish this feat, as they never had mortal flesh in the first place, though they are generally forbidden to do so. And I'm sure it's a rare occasion indeed when it is permitted. But being a writer, I yearn for readers. It would be ironic if I fare better in hell than I did in life in acquiring them. That would give even hell a positive aspect for me, and I like that idea, the notion of turning my punishment into something that works favorably for me, if even in some small and humble way. Yes, I must approach the owners of this bookstore, publishing house, one of these days soon. Before my journal gets too big for them to print, in the format they use. I can always write a volume, two and three, and so on. A continuing series if readership warrants it. Perhaps in reading about my personal experiences in hell, others will feel less alone in their suffering, more connected to their fellows. It's the aspiration of art, to share, to connect. But I won't limit myself to these memoirs. I will also write of the world we left behind. I'll write escapism, because art serves that less lofty but just as valuable purpose as well. My own poetry and short story collections. Yes, this gives me something to look forward to. I won't say something to live for. There were narrow alleys between some of these black brick row houses, which had a kind of colonial look, 
and which I assumed to be the oldest of Oblivion's structures. As I began to pass one alley that had a black iron gate blocking its end, a voice emerged from its shadowy throat. In here! Hurry! I stopped, looked, and saw a white apparition near the back of the alley. It took one step forward. It was Kara. After a glance over my shoulder to be sure no one was close enough to identify me, I gave the barred door a push. It swung open on its rusty hinges. I slipped into the alley, closing the gate behind me, and went to Kara's side. I don't live in the barracks anymore. I have a room. I'll take you there if you want. She whispered. She looked serious, intense, no smile of greeting, though why should there be? Then again, why should she be here at all? She had obviously done reconnaissance on my recent path home from work. Yes, I answered. Then I asked, Are you being hunted by your own kind? Some of them, not others. An investigator came around my work to talk to me. He was an angel. He... She looked even more grave, but said, Wait until we get to my place, then you can tell me all about it. I nodded and followed her out of the other end of the alley. It fed into a larger alley, heaped with broken furniture and half-stripped unidentifiable machinery, with sentinel trash cans presiding over the detritus. Then we plunged into another narrow alley, emerging onto a street unevenly paved in flagstones, and almost as narrow as an alley itself. This went on for a while, and I soon lost my orientation. We were in an obscure warren of streets I had never explored before. We were seen by various pedestrians, but they lowered their eyes in fear of Kara. Fortunately, we encountered no demons, who were in minority in oblivion in any case. I could see more clearly now that her hair was not braided as she characteristically wore it, hung freely down her neck as it had the first time I'd met her. She wore her sword. I wished I had my guns on me, but they were hidden back in my flat. As I had been doing lately, I had propped this book against my window so Lyre could at least have a view of the street, if not the skyline, blocked as it was by the vast machine building, to pass his intolerable hours. I hoped he wouldn't be worrying about where I was. Act like my prisoner, Kara hissed, as we emerged onto a broader street. She drew her sword and held it in one fist, her other hand gripping my wrist, and she almost literally dragged me stumbling along. People were really afraid to glance at her now that she looked like she meant business, though I imagined that they felt sympathy for me. We climbed a stone stairway, wedged between two close tenement houses, and emerged on an upper level of street. Ascending behind Kara, I couldn't keep my eyes off her buttocks as they pumped her strong legs, the wings folded against her back. I wondered if the wings had sensation. How would it feel for her if I touched them? My furtive lust left me feeling guilty, especially knowing how my fellow humans had suffered at this creature's hands. It was like lusting after a Nazi. But it seemed impossible for me not to stare at her incandescent white flesh. There was a bridge ahead, which people were walking across, though mainly it was just another available surface for building, covered in houses, and reminding me of photos I'd seen of Florence's Ponte Vecchio. We would be passing underneath it, through one of the shadowed arches of its stone base. Once we were underneath the bridge, however, Kara slipped a key out of a small pouch affixed to her scabbard's belt. She unlocked 
a rust-scabbed metal door set into the bridge's broad leg and led me into the small apartment she had rented or acquired. It was larger than my own flat, actually, but without even a single window. The walls and ceiling were entirely sheeted in copper, stained green with verdigris, especially on the ceiling, where the bare pipes that crossed it sweated moisture. There, a mineral and crustacean had accumulated to the point that it swallowed the pipes in spots, and miniature stalactites had formed here and there. Gas jets hissed on several walls. There were also banks of levers set into one wall, leading me to think this was originally meant as a utility area of some kind. Kara threw a heavy bolt to secure the iron door, then turned to face me. When you first set me free, she husked, I thought it might be because you were afraid not to. I thought maybe you were just a brown nose and a coward. I did it out of compassion, I protested. She held up her hand. But when you stood up to those fucking swine in blue, I realized you were stronger than I thought. Listen, there is this detective of some kind who came to my job. Before I could finish my sentence, Kara came at me. For a moment, terror blanked my mind. Had she lured me here to punish me? Did she think I had betrayed her to Inspector Turner? She seized my skull between her hands. Her face swooped at mine, her head tilted forward so that her dark-rimmed eyes looked up at me from beneath her brows. Her two full lips parted so that I only saw her bottom row of teeth. Then her predatory mouth was on my mouth. Her tongue was inside my soul. Kara's mouth squashed desperately against mine, and it seemed she wanted to suck the very breath out of me. My arms had gone around her, and my hands across her warm, bare flesh. Until I awkwardly came up against the unfamiliar jut of her wings. It had been so long since I had embraced Caroline back in the ruins of Caldera, and before that, my wife who rejected me. My whole body ached with a yearning beyond lust, seemingly beyond passion. Kara seemed just as frantic and feverish. I heard my shirt rip as she wrenched it up over my head. There was a bed that was little more than a cot, which Kara pushed me down on before sitting astride me. She reached between us to guide me into her, then plunged her weight down in one thrust, so that I cried out more in shock than pleasure. Straddling me, the female devil ground herself with a deep rotating rhythm atop me. Her wings opened and spread to their full length, trembling subtly with the overall tension of her body. They overshadowed us like a tent, one gas jet glowing through their translucent membranes from behind, silhouetting dark veins that seemed to visibly throb. I saw thick scars spaced along the wings now, too, from her crucifixion in the forest. I couldn't see her hands, wrists, feet or ankles at this angle, where there must be more scarring. As Kara herself had told me, the demons could heal, but not as thoroughly as humans could. My eyes dropped to her navel, where she had been skewered with the iron pike but no wound was evident in that shadowed indentation. Its alluring mystery was intact. Moaning, I ran my hands over her smooth thighs, slid them up to hold her waist as she rode me, reached to grip and squeeze her paper-white breasts, their grey nipples straining rubbery and hard against my palms. After we had both spent ourselves, she lay on her belly while I lay on my back one of her arms, and one of her open wings, lying across me as we cooled, sweat glistening on us, the air humid from our breath and heat. The wing was like a blanket. I ran my fingers lightly across it, tracing the veins, 
then touching one of the raised white scars. Stigmata. I stole a look at her face. Those thick gray lips were pressed into the subtlest of contented smiles, her heavy eyelids shut. Her beauty nearly made my chest tighten painfully. I wanted you from the second I saw you, I whispered. Without opening her eyes, she said, Did you know Verdelet was more than just my partner? A pause in which I said nothing. She was my lover as well. I'm sorry, I said. I meant it, though I felt a foolish stab of jealousy, and wondered if, with her eyes closed, she was imagining it was her dead lover whose shoulder she pressed her cheek to. I saw that her smile had faded. Her eyes opened, and head lifted to look up at me. You're different. You're the first man who I didn't want to be afraid of me. I don't want to be afraid of you either. I smiled. I don't know why I brought you here, she said. I don't know what I'm doing. You are rebelling against this whole thing, the angels, and what they want to do to you now, your job, which must be as mind-numbing as mine, the lack of freedom you suffer as much as I do. I am bored, she confessed, her gaze moving to the far wall. Do you know we demons try to think up different ways of torturing humans just to stave off the boredom? I wanted to joke how awful that must be, and how it made my heart bleed for the demons. But I was in fact still afraid of her. I let her go on. We are punished like you are, just like you said. We have no freedom. We are born to a hive, like ants. Nothing in the universe is promised justice, but my heart still cries out for this non-existent justice, like yours does. The Father's sense of justice is as alien to me as it is to you. When you don't analyze it, you can accept it. But when you make the mistake of scrutinizing it, then nothing makes sense anymore. At least you had a chance at heaven. My kind are born as adults. Our destiny is preordained. There is no Satan, no Lucifer, but I wish there was. My own deity to look after his own kind. Are you here now with me because you're bored? Because this is something new and exciting for you? Or is it because you were touched by the mercy I showed you? Both. She answered without hesitation. But I hesitated before I said, I am truly sorry about Verdelet. If you hadn't fought to protect me, she might still be alive. I thought about that. But it isn't your fault. I don't hold it against you. That's very Christian of you. Scorching eyes flicked up to mine. Don't make light of my compassion. It isn't something to be taken for granted. I don't, I assured her. But I trust in it. I know you have integrity and loyalty. So... So that's why I don't understand how you can hurt human beings. It's my job. I was born to it. I told you. An ant doesn't go to school. I was born as I am now. It's my very nature. The fact that I'm acting against that nature now shows what a freak I've become. How years of sameness have warped my thoughts and made me an aberration. I almost wish I could go back to the way I was. Please don't, I whispered, stroking the smooth round ball of her shoulder. Don't even say it. Your friend from the forest, she began. Caroline? I didn't catch up with her. I'm not sure if she made it to oblivion or not. But if you had found her, you'd have punished her. Because she wanted me to kill you. I didn't catch her, Kara snapped. That's all I wanted to tell you. You must have been wondering. She wasn't my girlfriend. We had sex once, 
out of loneliness. She sighed, calming her temper. Tell me about this man who came to see you, she said. Tell me everything. So I related Turner's visit. I told her about the Celestial. As frightening as they might seem, they can be killed like we demons can, Kara said, by way of slight reassurance. They're tougher to kill and faster to heal, but they can die. Like demons, they aren't true souls, not human souls. We aren't immortal like the damned and the angels. You said some of the demons are hunting for you, but others aren't? I think nearly all of my own kind would turn the other way if they saw me. Even Abaddon, he's the captain of the demon soldiers in Oblivion. But there are other demonic races in the city, not my kind, and not as sympathetic. I can't let myself trust any demon here, just to be safe. Then, then shouldn't you get out of Oblivion? Go somewhere far away, another city or someplace remote? I'm sure I will. So what have you been waiting for? A few beats, then... I've been waiting to see you. I lifted my hand to stroke her sweaty black hair, then kissed her damp white brow. I want to go with you, I said. All right, she answered, perhaps too embarrassed by her unfamiliar feelings at that moment to meet my eyes. But we didn't discuss plans or destinations just then. We made love again.